So, any questions? Okay, so um, what we will do today is uh, sort of the final bit in some sense of this uh, Andrew effect where we kind of connect with this uh, sort of older way of doing it which is to uh, compute um, compute the compute things in terms of modes okay so what we did is in some sense more general what we did this was we uh, did the calculation uh, for an interacting theory okay so interacting theory or a generic theory the, all it needed to do was that it had to be Lorentz invariant and uh, Euclidean invariant in uh, in uh, the in the Euclidean signature, so that's all we needed. So, but uh, and finally, the sort of the final message that we extracted from all of that was that we could write down the the vacuum state of Minkowski space in this form. Okay, in terms of the Rindler modes, Rindler eigenstates if you like so and the thing that I emphasized there was that because it was a path integral derivation we didn't really need to make sure that these things were free theory modes but we can be a little bit more explicit if you have free theory modes because the thing that you get when you have a free theory are creation and annihilation operators okay so when you when you have an interacting theory you don't have creation and annihilation operators but the path integrals basically let you write the vacuum state the Minkowski vacuum state in terms of the spectrum Okay, so that's what we did. So if you had magically access to the spectrum of the theory, then we have, uh, we can do this calculation, okay, for any quantum field theory. So what we instead want to do today is that we want to, um, we want to uh, make things more explicit in some sense and connect with this old way of doing it, which is to write it in terms of Bogolibo transformations and so on. I won't really, well, I mean, I'll finally write down the Bogolibo transformation, but, uh, you know, it'll, we don't have to say the words necessarily okay so so that's what we have so okay so and in this uh, so you can take a look at Harlow's lecture which is sort of what I'm following here so um, so that's the so that's kind of a place to look at um, yeah so now we want to write these things for free theories free theories uh, make things more explicit More explicit in particular introduce so and as I said you know last time towards the end of the lecture what I said was that free theories are not just a toy but they are also important from a sort of a fundamental point of view for holography okay so so what we'll first do is we will we have to look at how to split the space-time okay so this was our familiar picture by now Okay, so the, the idea is that we are doing all the hard work with Rindler and then we can just, you know, I can say some words and uh, believe that some things work similarly for black holes as well. So that's our goal. Okay, so that's the reason we are spending time with Rindler and doing sort of Rindler in, let's say, somewhat fancy ways or like connecting with path integrals and various things like that. So that all the tools that we need are kind of built and uh, then uh, we can hopefully just uh, go ahead with things fairly straightforward. Okay, so this is our left wedge, this is our right wedge, okay? So, and the thing that I mentioned was that if you have a Cauchy slice like this, you, you know, you, you, if you have, if you know how to do your mode expansion in this guy and this guy separately, the idea is that we should, this is equivalent to knowing the mode expansion in the uh, Minkowski slice, this total slice, okay? So, the idea is basically what we'll do is we'll uh, write our um, wave equation uh, you know, we will solve the free wave equation, okay? So the free wave equation means the massive scalar field equation in the Rindler wedge and also in Minkowski and essentially the goal is to connect these two things, okay? So, so the first thing to do is to identify a suitable, identify a suitable mode expansion in the Rindler wedge. In the Rindler wedge, in the left and left and right Rindler wedges. Okay, so in our, so we already have a coordinate system, and we want to solve our wave equation in that coordinate system. So, in general, so in, in general, we are interested in t x y z 
three plus one dimensional example. But uh, so that's where we'll start. But at some point I will, you know, so the equations will become too complicated. Complicated in the sense the wave equations will become Bessel functions and all that. So at that point I will say that, okay, there is a simple model where uh, things are extremely tractable and all the physics is actually there, which is the case of one plus one dimensional Rindler with massless scale. Okay, so the extra stuff will just essentially just complicated our lives with, uh, you know, the modes will be more complicated, very roughly speaking. Okay, so uh, that's what we are going to do. So this is our starting setup. So, but we'll start here. Okay, so, and the modes here we will call FL and FR. If you remember from our definition of the Klein-Gordon inner product, this is the notation that I used for general modes. Okay, so, and, oh, is it mine? Let me just turn it off, sorry. My phone is almost never on, so I'm surprised. Okay, so, um, yeah, so what we want to do is we want to write these two guys in Rindler space. Okay, so the Rindler space being, so we'll introduce a slightly different coordinate system. I sort of introduced that coordinate system earlier in one, one of our uh, early lectures when you're talking about uh, Rindler, but let me make it uh, explicit by calling it this and I'm following as I said you know Harlow's notation here so you can look at cinch uh, dr okay so I introduced almost similar notation previously so then I you know collected these two things and called them you know u is equal to e to the minus u something like that so sorry e to the minus small u so this my u will be tau minus r basically okay so let me not um, yeah, so, but I'm introducing it again, once again here. So, and similarly, this is on the right wedge. And on the left wedge, I will define cosh tau L. And these coordinate definitions are important, eh? Because that's where most of the, almost everything is happening. All the sign problems, etc. you have to, this is where you have to deal with it. So, uh, so this is the left wedge, okay? And the motivation for defining this, so, so if, if you remember, so the, you know, our coordinate system was such that uh, if you had your, did I draw it here? Yeah, good. So this was my uh, Minkowski space Tx if you like, and this is my capital U, okay? So capital U is uh, T minus X, so, and, these are the two coordinates that we have, T and V. And uh, so this was, uh, so this direction, so T minus X, so this region, this, this direction was U greater than zero. This was U less than zero. So this is, this, is, this is the U greater than zero direction. So this is U less than zero. And this is uh, V greater than zero. All of this is capital V. And this is v less than zero. Okay, so going this way. So these are the four different directions. So which means that your positive quadrant here in this u v coordinates, capital U, capital V. So note that capital U and capital V are defined as t minus x and v is t plus x. Okay, so this is your definition. So so that's how you fix the signs because we know what the signs of t and x are in each quadrant. So once you do that. The point is that uh, we want, we chose our coordinates so that you got, so in, you know, so now if you combine them, you will see that this is nothing but u is equal to minus e to the minus small u, where u, small u is uh, tau r minus psi r, and capital V, cap, this thing is uh, e to the plus v, where small plus v is tau r plus psi r. Okay, so that's the definitions. So these coordinates, so this is what you always introduce in the first quadrant. Okay, and uh, in the second, in the, in this, in the, in the right quadrant, and in the left case, what I'm defining here is, you know, with this particular choice of signs. And this is, so the, the one thing that we definitely cannot 
Um, so let me write what this means in terms of u and v. So if you define again, always t minus x is capital U and t plus x is capital V. And the same thing here, u and v have a standard convention whichever coordinate you have to pick. Okay? So that means that this means on the, this is for right and on the left you would have um, u is equal to e plus u, small u and uh, v is equal to minus e minus v where now this u is the tau l minus psi l okay and uh, this v is tau l plus psi l okay so here note that the u maybe i should put a subscript here uh, yeah maybe i should put a subscript here so this is u r v r and this is uh, Okay, so, uh, sorry, this is UL. Fine? So the crucial thing to note here is that this sign is fixed and this sign is fixed because you are living in this quadrant. Okay, so this sign has to be a plus and this sign has to be a minus because you are living in this quadrant. And similarly, this sign has to be minus and this sign has to be plus because you are living in this direction, this quadrant. But there is no real choice about UL and VL. You can define it either way you like. Okay? So UL is going from, you know, some uh, infinity to minus infinity. Then this U will go from 0 to infinity or 0 to minus infinity depending on which quadrant you are. 0 to minus infinity or minus infinity to 0. Okay? So this is up to you. What choice of sign that you take here or here. Okay? And so we are going to make a specific choice motivated by... So this particular choice that I have written here so this is the sign that I was emphasizing when I first introduced this, introduced this uh, you know, cross color, uh, you know, this thing. But this sign is now I'm going to treat it some care because we want, so if you remember, there was this CPT transformation that we worked with, right? The CPT transformation is kind of an important ingredient in all this business. So that CPT, what it does is, uh, CPT or more correctly CRT, what it does is we want it to do this under or let me start with here this is what I want to want CPT to do okay if I want CPT to do that what what that what does that really actually mean it means that in the direction so in the direction so I want the time direction the tau direction to be decreasing when my this direction is increasing that's what you know when my minkowski time direction is increasing i want the tau to be decreasing that's what it really means okay and that choice is what dictates this plus sign if i flip this plus sign and this minus sign then you know it, that, that choice is not very important for the purposes of fixing this these guys fixing the quadrant that is not important it's a coordinate choice at that stage okay but in order to make my cpt action more um, let's say intuitive or transparent what I need to do is I need to make this particular choice so that when I flip the sign flip when I act with CPT on this and I get my coordinate TL I want the TL to increase in the direction where the Minkowski time is decreasing okay so that's what I'm doing here so that's what fixes these signs okay so so yeah if, if it is if it is not completely clear the the, the, the you know the statement that I made just now, you can sort of try to remember it and then try to reconstruct the signs. Okay, so that's what fixes these signs. Okay, so, but again, just to be very clear about what is happening. So this means that uh, this region is defined by capital U is less than zero and capital V is greater than zero. And this is defined by U is uh, greater than zero and V is less than zero. So this is what defines these regions all right yeah yeah so that's basically the philosophy of fixing those signs um, yeah and the reason why I'm emphasizing it because when I wrote it last time I did not pay attention to this thing and uh, I think I wrote it minus and plus okay because I didn't at that time the only thing I wanted to fix was these regions the fact that these uh, coordinates span these regions but now I care about the CPT action as well, so these signs are important. Okay? 
So yeah. Okay. So with that, uh, so so you know, so uh, but all said and done, the only thing that is happening is that. You know, from my Minkowski code at x and t, on this wedge I'm going to on, on this wedge I'm going to use this coordinates, and on this wedge I'm going to use this coordinates. Okay. So note that x and t are valid everywhere on this diagram, but psi r and tau r are valid only here, and psi r and psi l and tau l are valid only here. Okay. So those are different coordinate ranges. So uh, so now I can write down my metric in this Rindler coordinates. Okay, and uh, and y and z are the same. Okay, the y and z directions I'm working with three dimensions or four dimensions. So the y and z directions are basically the same. They just sit there. That's why I'm not writing them. Okay, so even for Rindler coordinates, the y and z remains the same for Rindler as well. So the metric is uh, is equal to e to the two psi r. plus dy square plus dz square and uh, this is e to the 2 psi l minus e to the 2 psi l minus d tau l square and the y and z directions are shared by Minkowski, left Rindler and right Rindler. So these are the guys that change. Okay, so and the goal now, so this is, uh, because we know that this is a globally hyperbolic region, now we can solve our wave equations in these coordinates. Okay? So, um, and that's what we are going to do. So, and the claim is that, so what we are looking for is we are going to look for modes of this form. Okay, so this can be, so this equation, this is, a, this is the definition of the mode because I have chosen my tau direction with the, you know, like, uh, you know, with, with, with the knowledge that this is how it should be. I can, you know, this is the mode, this is the expression for the mode in either of these, you know, either of these things. Okay, so, um, yeah, so these things all have subscripts. R, actually this omega also has a subscript K. Okay, let me just write that here. Because K is, stands for these guys. Okay, because the omegas are always determined via the wave equation in terms of uh, the, the, the spatial momentum, right? So, and this is, omega has a subscript uh, K, but it also has a subscript R or L. Tau also has the same thing. And K and these guys don't have any subscript anywhere because they're shared, shared by everything. And this guy, this psi also has a subscript here as well as this psi also. I don't know, I'm calling everything psi here, I think. So uh, this is psi and uh, this is c maybe. So that's the so this is the notation. So all these come with subscripts which are r and l, and it's a small exercise to fix it properly. So I'm just writing the positive energy modes here, which means that omega k is supposed to be greater than zero. Okay, omega k r and l. There are both of them. So and uh, the 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 negative energy modes, which are also required to expand the general solution, will will uh, they will have a Hermitian conjugation here or a, a complex conjugation here. So and that will flip these two eyes. Okay. So okay. Yeah. So this first will take care of the tau L and like tau L goes in the direction of decreasing Minkowski time. So this choice will take care of. The yes. So I can, yeah, so this mode is basically positive energy with respect to tau L, okay? So that's what that mode is. So yeah, and it is engineered so that that'll work out. So now the point is, so the, the crucial point here is that now, so now I'm going to expand my scale of Minkowski uh, uh, field, scalar field, and I'm going to write it like this. You know, so we won't care, you know, like I don't want to carry around these, all these d cube omegas, all the Fourier, these things, etc. So the thing that we, I want, the statement that we want to make will be clear, uh, you know, without, go, you know, all the details of all the modes. But they are not entirely completely trivial. So you sometimes have to worry about normalizations, etc. You know, it's, technically they are not in, in completely trivial. But on the other hand, you know, carrying it around is not going to help the... The, let's say the communication. So I'm not going to keep that around, but you should remember that these things are not exactly a sum. Okay, they are, in fact, they are integrals and all that. 
okay but uh, schematically i'll write this as uh, f r omega k a r omega k plus f l omega k a l omega k so these are the uh, annihilation operators and then you have the hermitian conjugate of both of these things okay or uh, yeah complex conjugate multiplying the hermitian conjugate so this is the structure of a general minkowski solution so what i'm implicitly doing there is this picture that i erased you can kind of see here still where is that i'm expanding the general solution in terms of modes of this plus modes of this so that's it so that's why there are two sets of modes okay so um and that's what that is and the, the so the the observation is that so of course i forgot to mention one thing which is that if i plug it in so the idea is that these things should solve the rindler wave equation okay these guys are solving the rindler wave equation not minkowski so and if you write it out express explicitly so these things have been engineered to take care of the isometries of the space okay so these will just they, they will all uh, you know lead to trivial equations but the one that is non trivial is basically this so i think pradeepa is an expert in this equation okay so this i'm writing it for both at the same time so i'm again not putting any subscripts r or l okay so this is uh, this is the rindler wave equation okay so rindler wave equation with some mass you know some mass and there is uh, transverse dimensions so this is a 3 plus 1 dimensional rindler equation okay so and this is a messy equation a messy in the sense it has it has some interesting physics but uh, the physics that we care about right now is not so much related to that so but the point is so you can see that if the if there are no extra dimensions this k square basically means <laughs> kx z square plus ky square okay so that's what that is so if there is no transverse dimensions you go to 1 plus 1 dimensions and you work with the massless scalar field equation the equation basically just becomes the harmonic oscillator equation again like which is the only problem that we know how to solve right so so we have so by setting these two things to zero so 1 plus 1 dimensions in massless uh, scalar field this equation becomes extremely simple okay we can solve it trivially it is just the usual modes uh, you know the e to the i k x type modes that we have in minkowski but now for e to the i with some you know this uh, e to the i omega oh, you know it's a, it's a function basically just of uh, this omega you know so okay let me just write it explicitly this is uh, much easier than so all that it will really do here is that i will get e to the i omega psi right that's all that will happen from solving it and essentially what this statement means is that i can drop this guy and i can drop this guy and then this will be replaced with here so you see that they are the standard modes but in tau plus sigma and tau minus sigma okay so uh, so that's what so that's what the advantage of going to 1 plus 1 dimensions is okay but also yeah so uh, but yeah so we are it's not that we are not completely losing um, you know we are, so the the massive case massive and uh, transverse dimension case i think it is an illustrative exercise i think it is worth doing i think if you are so inclined i encourage you to try and do it and uh, good reference where all the necessary signs have been kept track of and uh, there aren't at least to my awareness many typos is a review by crispino um i mean one more person is higuchi and uh, i can't remember the name of the third author okay so it's called the uh, andrew effect and its applications okay so this is the this is the so you can take a look at that if you want to really uh, grind through it okay so yeah right uh any questions yeah so okay so uh so yeah so what i'm going to do is i'm going to specialize to massless case and i'm also going to assume that we are in 1 plus 1 dimensions so essentially what you are seeing here see the wave equation you know its form hasn't changed 
right? So that's actually a property of the fact that massless scalar field equations are in uh, are basically conformal equations. You know, conformal. They are some sort of a toy example of a conformal field theory. So if you're in a conformal field theory, if you change the overall scale of the metric, note that the metric here also looks Minkowski up to an overall scale, right? If you don't have these two things. Right? So if, you, if your metric is essentially a wild transform, this kind of a scale transformation is called a wild transform. If the metric is just getting wild rescaled, then conformal equations, conformal field theories, they don't change. So the scale, it doesn't affect the physics. So and this is like a kind of a simple manifestation of that fact. Okay? So a massless scalar field equation is a conformal field theory. Scalar field theory is a conformal field theory. This is the simplest example of a conformal field theory. And so when you go to 1 plus 1 dimensions, because the metric is just getting rescaled and it is massless, you get the same thing. So physics hasn't changed. So that's what is really happening there. Okay. So now I want to write my uh, omega. So my, uh, you know, vacuum state. So before I wrote it in a slightly abstract form where I assume that I know what the spectrum is like spectrum of the theory but I actually now I know the spectrum right so the here so I have so so uh, I will write it like this so let me write it so yeah so this is one place where I am again being a little quick I'll explain some of these things Okay, so the claim is that uh, for the free theory, I have, you know, when I solved it, I found some omega and that omega is completely fixes the, the mode, right? And there will be an integral over that omega. Note that on the massless theories, this omega gets fixed. There is, you know, there is an omega and the k in the side direction, but they are both the same because it's on shell. So that's what this equation is really doing. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so that basically means that I have, uh, you know, the, sp the spectrum of my theory is basically constructed from a Fox space of modes with uh, energies omega. Okay, that's why this n omega is coming here. Okay, so because it's uh, each level is n omega. But then there is also one more thing which I'm really not, you also have to look at each omega. Okay, so because if you, you know, this is, this is, this problem has, you have an integral over all the omegas here, you know, or integral or, or, the, or the sum over all the omegas. That means that corresponding to each of those guys, you basically need to, you know, take a product of all of them. You see what I'm saying? So there is, so this normalization I'll fix in a second. This is basically just the statement that omega i here is n times omega. Okay. And this, this is basically what is counting the levels. Okay, and this is the sort of the, uh, you know, the part which is, uh, you know, like it is, it is, it is, it's a discretization essentially. It's a discretization of my integral that I want to do in omega i. And in principle, I can make it an integral, but the price that I have to do is that I have to make my oscillators somehow smoothed out by a, a smoothing function. Okay, and I don't want to do that and it's basically just a waste of energy in some ways. So I will not do that, but if you want to take a look, you can look at this uh, review, how they do it exactly. So the, the point here is that I'm basically just thinking of them as discretizing the omegas and then just taking the, uh, you know, the product of, tensor product of or, or all of them. Okay, or more, uh, if you want to be even more, slightly more precise, I can write it like this so that it looks a little bit more concrete. And I'll fix this normalization in a second so it will be less magical. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so this is what I'm really saying, but uh, in this is sort of written in a notation that is more adapted to Harlow. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is the this is basically the spectrum of the theory, and the normalization here is fixed using the fact that if you remember my rho Rindler was one by z e to the minus two pi omega i. If you remember, 
Okay, so that was my uh, the the row ruler that we computed. So, and if you demand that the trace of row is one, that will you you'll basically find that z has to be equal to um, sigma over i e to the minus two pi omega i. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, let me just erase this. So if if so if this is this sum is written in this way, so you'll have e to the one plus e to the two pi omega, e to the four pi omega, etc., and that basically gives you one by. This is what you're fixing. Okay, so that's your z. So and then you take the one by root z. So note that this was one by root z, and that's what this is. Okay, so that fixes the normalization. So overall, we have. Uh, yeah, so essentially this is, you know, you can, it's easy to understand in some sense because it is like for every mode, you have all the harmonic oscillator entire tower, so you get this N, and then you have, uh, you know, a normalization that is coming from fixing the Rindler, uh, you know, the trace of the Rindler uh, density matrix to be one, okay, and that fixes this. So, and the structure is basically this. So, this is the only part which is a little bit fishy. Essentially, because of the fact that I'm doing a discretization, because I want to avoid some technicalities. Okay, but it won't really matter for our uh, discussions. Okay, so um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And so the so the so the advantage in working with free modes is that these omega i's in the in the in the interacting theory we don't really know what they are. It's just a you know it's just a you know you, you just know that they should exist. Here, on the other hand, we explicitly know what they are. Okay, so um, yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a it's a pretty complicated expression. Okay, but it's a free theory. It's a complicated expression because you have modes corresponding to each omega, and then you are looking at the tower of harmonic oscillator like guys for each of them. That's why this for each omega there is a tensor product like structure, and then then for each of those uh, omegas you have this, you know, levels which are getting populated. Okay, so that's why it is a somewhat messy expression. Yeah. No, this omega basically just counts the one particle spectrum, right? So this omega is coming from the omega that shows up in your wave equation. So that's essentially like, you know, you can think of it as a K. So because in stand, you know, it's some slightly more, so in, in higher dimensions, for instance, this omega would be fixed Let's say, I mean, in, in at least, you know, in, let's say, if it is Minkowski space or something, you will have kx square plus ky square plus kz square, right? So each of these, so what you really have is an ak and an a dagger k, if you like, okay? But then you can act with each of them as many number of times as you want. And that's where this n is coming, okay? So this omega you should compare to this k. So the case that you are you know, um, integrating over, or, you know, in the mode expansion, which translates basically to in the state when you write it, it becomes a tensor product like expression. So this omega is coming from the case in the problem. And that's the reason why, you know, and this, um, you know, this n is coming from the fact that you can e act with each of those a daggers as many number of times as you want. So this is coming from the multi-particle, if you like. And this omega is coming from the single particle spectrum. Any other questions? Sorry, can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, because, uh, uh, so, you know, so when you solve, so for instance, when you solve a scalar field equation, what you find are the single modes of that theory, right? So you will find you, each of your uh, creation annihilation operators are basically labeled by a K. So what you're saying about why am I not taking the, why, why should I take the tensor product is really the same question as why am I integrating in the mode expansion over all k. So I can take 1k and then construct a set of states which only have any as many number of a daggers as I want acting on it. So but that will just correspond to a, a set of particles with fixed momentum if you like. Okay. So in order to construct the full Hilbert space, I need to take the tensor product over all of them. And that's what this thing is. Is that fine? So yeah, so uh, yeah, so it's, I know it's a little bit of a, 
uh, Baroque looking expression because there is this this guy and then there is a sum and then there is an omega and uh, but it is it is really the same ingredients that are there so if you are confused I suggest that you look back at what you have in Minkowski space because in Minkowski space a similar structure exists and the only difference here in some sense is that typically we write the Minkowski things in terms of integrals over the kx, ky, kz and the omega k is implicitly determined in terms of those, those k's. But here what happens is that it's a bit more convenient because I'm writing it in 1 plus 1 dimensions, k just directly fixes omega. So I'm, I can think of the integral as a sub integral over omega if I like. So that's really what is happening in some, another way of saying the same thing. So it's, it's more conventional to write it in this way. So otherwise I would have to write it in terms of, yeah, I could write it in terms of kx, ky, kz if I wanted to. And in higher dimensions this expression is a little bit more even messy. That's the reason why I chose not to write it. Okay, but you can, uh, you know, like uh, as I said, it's an interesting exercise to make sure that you're not confused by working it out for the massless, sorry, the massive, um, um, you know, Rindler, massive scale, you know, scalar field in let's say 3 plus 1 dimensions. And Crispino does it in glorious detail. To, uh, you know, so you can take a look if you like. Right. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's in the case of the mode expansion, right? So if you're trying to construct the actual Fox space, you will need to take products of each of them, right? So if you're, if you're writing the mode expansion, yes, you have a sum over every possible mode. That you should think of, roughly speaking, as the analog of spins at each lattice site, okay? So it's basically, we are writing the integral in momentum space, but it's a proxy for, you know, yes. the thing that comes from space time or space. So, and uh, so that's the analog of that. But if you want to construct the, the Hilbert space, you have to associate a Hilbert space to each lattice site. See what I'm saying? It's basically the difference, the, the an analogy is between if you have a icing model, you, you write this as sigma i, sigma i plus one or whatever. Okay, with some other things also, but I don't care. So this is I, so this is a sum. But if I construct the Hilbert space of icing model, I have to take a tensor product over each lattice site. You know what I'm saying? So there will be a qubit here, a qubit here, a qubit here, a qubit here. So the full Hilbert space is the tensor product of every lattice site. Okay, so that's the analog of this tensor product here. But maybe this can also translate because this is a type of Hilbert, like type of this summation over that exponential. E to the minus beta h is a density matrix. Yeah. Here, this is this is showing up. This is a thermophile double state. This is a pure state. It's not a density matrix, but it's an entangled pure state between the left and right Hilbert spaces. Okay, so this is this e to the this is not directly. I mean, it is related at the, at the end of the day. This pi is basically beta by two, but it is not. You know, it's not a Hamiltonian or anything like that. So it's a, it's it's a very specific entangled state in the Hilbert space. Uh, the tensor product Hilbert space of h left and h right. Can you say that again? Sorry. Oh, you mean like, uh, am I looking at some specific time? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, this, it's, you could ask, you know, Minkowski vacuum, you expect it to be translation, time translation invariant, right? So, first of all, you have to specify, it is true, I mean, you can think of it as defined as the t equal to zero slice. And then you can talk about how it will evolve under, let's say, a Minkowski Hamiltonian, because this thing can evolve under Minkowski Hamiltonian, right? And that's, a, that's an interesting question for various purposes. But one thing we can be sure of is that this is a boost invariant state. And the reason is that if you boost this guy and boost this guy, the two guys will get signs in the opposite way. Okay, so the, which means that it will basically just cancel off. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I don't know whether that is, uh, yeah, so it's, it's um, yeah, so. Sorry? Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah. So this is basically the t equal to zero slice. I was thinking about some tangential thing suddenly. But the, this is the t equal to zero slice and you're, you know, and uh, this state is, th you can think of it as being defined, you know, here. And the point is that from now on you can evolve it. If you want, you can evolve the, only the right or the left half with the, let's say the Hamiltonian of the right wedge or the left wedge. Or you can uh, evolve it with respect to, um, 
uh, you know, the Minkowski time evolution, which also you can do, because this state is actually living in the Minkowski vacuum, Minkowski Hilbert space. Yes, because if you act with the Hamiltonian that is, or any operator that is well defined only on the left Rindler space, Hilbert space, that will just evolve this guy. Right? It will pick up some phase or coefficients or whatever, and it will do that, and this guy will also do similar things. And you can again interpret that as a new state in Minkowski Hilbert space as well. Right? Because whatever you do here, it will end up giving you something, but ultimately it is an, op you know, it's an operation that, it's a state that lives in the Minkowski Hilbert space. Right? So you can always interpret it that way. So, yeah, so yeah, so coming back to the statement that I, you know, what um, uh, Pradita was asking. So, the question is why is it that, that here it is a sum or integral and here it is a tensor product? And the answer is basically that this is the analogy to keep in mind is again the Ising model. So, the Ising model has a sum here, and uh, if you are taking the tensor Hilbert space, you have to take a tensor product of all of them. Okay, so that is what you want to do. Okay, so I think that is. Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, so that's uh, so this is again related. So I think you could ask why is it that I have not written n star here because it is it has to be the CPT conjugate, right? But the reason for that is that I have chosen time reversal as I mentioned last time. So n star will basically be minus n if you like. You know what I think? But minus n means that the energy of the state is negative of what it used to be. And we don't want that because the theory will be unbounded from below. So instead what we do, that's precisely the reason why we have chosen time reversal to be an anti-unitary anti operator. So if it acts on this thing, it basically gives you the eigenstates remain as they are or the Hamiltonian doesn't flip sign. But instead what happens is that the i is what flips sign. So state remains as it is, we don't have to worry. But there is a subtlety because if you go to higher dimensions for instance, you know, what CPT does is, uh, or CRT does more precisely, is that uh, you know, you have tau L or tau R psi R going to minus tau L minus psi L. This is how we have, this is how we have defined it, right? So if this is how we have defined it, then what happens is if you, you know, so time evolutions, you know, your, uh, your, your modes will basically will pick up, um, you know, so, so, so what you do at the level of states in the Hilbert space or at the level of operators is that you do this operation and then you do a Hermitian conjugate. That's what you do. So if you do this flip here, so you can see that this mode, if I do this, you know, this, is, this has to have a TL, TR for each of them. I do a flip and then, you know, because of that flip, this will pick up a plus sign. Okay, but because of the Hermitian conjugation, it will again come back to a correct sign, but in the process this guy will get a negative sign. Okay, so if I do that, then in the, there will be, you know, this omegas in higher dimensions will basically be functions of k's, and then the corresponding omega for this guy will have to have a negative sign associated with it. Okay, so that is, uh, that is also part of the reason why I didn't want to get involved with it. So it, it, it's like becomes, introduces more notation than necessary. Okay, yeah. What do you mean by physical state? So, if the omega still takes some extended space. Extended? Yeah. So, we are extended means uh, you are talking about like uh, gauge invariance or something like that? Yeah. No, there is no gauge invariance here at the moment because all the operators that I am acting with are like uh, physical operators, right? Boost is a charge, Hamiltonians are charges, so they are all like operators acting on the Hilbert space. They are just doing their thing. So, no, no, because when we construct a radius density matrix, uh -huh. No, there is there is no gauge invariance here, right? So, uh, so what what we are doing is we are so we traced out the left side, and whatever is left, we are just tracing over it. That's it. So we computed the reduced density matrix, and then we just summed over, you know, the diagonals of this. So that sum is basically what this is. Okay. So this is what that sum is. I don't know whether I answered your question. I think you have a. But maybe you can try asking again because uh, I think uh, maybe other people also have the similar question. So it seems like there is some conceptual issue. I'm asking if there is any inherent gauge symmetry in the gauge. See, so if, whenever there is a symmetry, it's a question up to you whether you choose to gauge it, right? When you say that some a gauge symmetry is there, what it really means is that you're acting with an operator, the state changes, and you declare that both these things are the same state. That's what gauge invariance means. We have not done that here. 
right? There are symmetries in the problem and we are acting on operators, acting with operators on these states and the states change and then we look at the states. That's all we are doing. We are not declaring that these two states are equivalent. They are not in the same equivalence class. We are not saying that. We are just saying that we are acting with certain symmetries like boosts and Hamiltonians and all that. But they are acting and you, they generate new states. They are not, it's not that they are the same state. We are not saying that. Okay, so in that sense there is no real gauge invariance at the moment, but it could be an interesting question whether we should gauge some of these things. That's a separate question. Here, I'm just saying that, um, you know, in Minkowski space, at least conventional Minkowski space, boosts and translations are genuine symmetries of the Hilbert space. That's what special relativity has tells us, right? So, and that's what we are doing here. So, in that sense, there is no gauge invariance, but yeah, entanglement is very closely related to gauge invariance. So, there are many various similarities and analogies that probably are, you know, important in some sense, but at the moment, at least at, at the surface level, there is no gauge invariance here. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so, yeah, so now I want to write, ah, uh, yeah, so where is my, yeah, so this thing that I wrote here, now I make one observation, okay, I'm just going to make one observation. And uh, so I'll define two operators, which is define. So I'm just pulling it out of a hat. So normalizations are not super important, but uh, okay, I define two operators. And you can check that these both these operators, you know, either of them. So if you act with that on this guy, the state will vanish. Okay? So that this is um, this is uh, you know this one, this operator essentially is an annihilation operator for Minkowski vacuum. Okay, so and similarly this. Okay, so in some sense, um, <coughs> what we are really saying is that, uh, um, yeah, so in a sense, I mean, uh, there are, we will come back to this in some more detail eventually. So one way to look at, so essentially what we are saying is that these modes that we have constructed here are kind of like the Minkowski creation annihilation operators. Okay. So, uh, so that's essentially, I mean, I just wanted to make that one little observation, all right? So this, this, this particular modes, so this is an example of, if you like, a Bogolibov transformation. So what the, we are seeing here, the fact that the A's and A daggers mix, makes it a non-trivial Bogolibov transformation. Okay, so you had a right Rindler guy and a left Rindler guy. So note that, but it is a little bit tricky to call it, it's like, you know, people, you know, in many cases in quantum field theory and curved space, what you mean by uh, Bogolibov transformation is that you have the same Hilbert space and you have different A's and A daggers acting here. But here it's a little bit more tricky because this and this are acting on different Hilbert spaces. But nonetheless, you know, there you can add some identity operators and think of it as a suitable Bogolibov transformation. So this is an example of what? Okay, so that's the, so I think I will, uh, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, Andrew and hopefully we have enough understanding of these things to now just kind of wholesale go from here to black hole stuff. Okay, so the things that we have discussed here are kind of all that we will really need. Technically, I think we are in fairly good setting. So now hopefully, you know, it will be more story-like, you know what I'm saying? So, but uh, the things that we are going to talk about obviously are important anyway because the black holes are obviously, you know, there is, what is the difference between a black hole and uh, just Rindler space? That's sort of the question in some ways. Okay. Okay, so but uh, I, I'll, I'll conclude today with one more comment, which is to do with, uh, which is to do with uh, entanglement, because yesterday I mentioned some things and I didn't have time to talk about it. So I just want to make a couple of brief comments about entanglement. So what we observed last time was that if you have two, you know, phi x and phi y, which are space-like separated, so this was not zero in uh, quantum field theory. 
Okay, so we notice that these guys are uh, operate these expectation values basically um, in space like separated expectation values have very universal behavior in both in the infrared, which means long distances, as well as ultraviolet, which means short distances. So that's what we noted last time. Okay, so uh, except in the case of conformal field theories, where it doesn't depend on the length scale at all, it's always as if you know it's the same exact behavior. So that's what we noticed. And but the crucial point that we uh, said was that there is non-trivial entanglement, and we also noticed that one-point functions vanished. Okay, so now I just want to build an analogy to say what this is. This is an example of entanglement. Just to say again, using Harlow's analogy, is that uh, let's right consider a ket of this form, which I can write it like this. Okay, so this is, uh, if you like, it's a bell pair or something. Okay, so, um, and, uh, yeah, so the point is that this state, you cannot um, write as a tensor, a tensor product. This is an entangled state. Okay, and one way to test that is that, you can check that one particle, so this xi, let me define this poly operators, which is 0, 1, 1, 0. And z is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay, so these are my poly matrices. And I'm following the kind of the quantum information notation where, you know, in particle physics, we usually typically write it as sigma, sigma x, sigma y, but in because this is more convenient for us, because it avoids one index, because we will need our indices. So, so for instance, when I write xi, it means which qubit it is. So here, i equal to 1 is basically this guy, and i equal to 2 is this, or i equal to a and i equal to b. So these are the two tensor factors in the problem. Okay, there is a qubit here and a qubit here, and the same, this is also a, this is also b. Okay, so this is my... Uh, this is my Hilbert space, and this xi here is uh, this xi is when I have an i here, it just means which uh, state is which of uh, which, which which tensor factor is acting on. Okay, so uh, so which tensor factor is it act acting on? So uh, it's easy to check that this guy acting on psi. I haven't checked it, but I believe Harlow, so it's zero. Okay, so and uh, you can also check that uh, there is non-trivial entanglement if you compute any of these things. Is equal to one. Is equal to minus one, and similarly there is also z one z two psi is equal to plus one. Okay, so these are the three things that we have, and they are not vanishing. Okay, so they're not vanishing, and uh, what you get is it's a it's an analogy with what we had here. The one-point functions vanish, but the two-point functions don't. Okay, so this is that's one reason, if you like, to think of it as entanglement, right? So uh, so it's uh, so, but I want to emphasize a couple of things when I say that, and that is related to the fact that quantum field theory is not just a collection of spins because Lorentz invariance is you know it's not possible to discretize Lorentz invariance to the best of our knowledge okay so that means that when we try to compute these entanglement entropies at short distances there are these divergences right like for instance when I wrote down my two-point correlation function let's say for um, you know let me call it O x I'll write it like this Okay, so this is okay. Where this, uh, yeah, I mean, let me call it square. So these are free scalars. So this is uh, this is what the two-point function looks like. So if the two-point function in a conformal field theory basically looks like this, and this is just a you know token example. You could work with other theories as well. But the point I want to make is that in X and Y are close, this blows up. Right, and this is the key point about this is that this is not a feature of so it typically, for instance, this entanglement here is very closely related to the state that you're considering. 
So this state is an entangled state and you acted with some operators here uh, and you find that it is entangled. Okay? But here it is believed that the entanglement between uh, in the state, you know, the entanglement uh, that we are seeing here, it's a universal divergence that you will see in any state in quantum field theory. So if you have a quantum field theory and you take any state, it doesn't have to be the vacuum, and you compute this, I mean, you know, most of the time you're not able to compute it, but you can argue for various reasons in some various cases. And what you will find is that this is always universally divergent. Okay? And so it is believed that it is not a property of the states that you're working with, but it's a property of the algebra of operators. So the algebra of operators basically means that if you have a subregion, you know, if you have a subregion like this, operators acting on this particular subregion are called is the algebra of operators in that subregion. So this is a well-defined idea in quantum field theory because as you know, operators are basically labeled by some x, which is x is basically the location at which the operator is acting or op operator is labeled by. So if you give me a subregion, which is basically an infinite list of x's, you know, this is basically just x's, right? So some spatial location. So which means that I have a set of operators that act there. So that operate, so the set of operators that act on that uh, subregion is what forms an algebra. Okay, so that, uh, you know, essentially because operators have satisfied some algebra, there is some, they have some computation relation or whatever, so that gives you an algebra and the, 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 the claim is that in quantum field theory, in quantum field theory, the entanglement is associated to the entanglement between subregions is associ associated to the operator algebra on that subregion, on those subregions. Okay? And this is a universal ultraviolet divergence is there in all quantum field theories. And uh, because of which, you know, this is a currently active area of research. It's like the, you know, kind of in the last couple of years, uh, you know, there has been a lot of work on things related to this. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I don't. Let me not say much more about it. But I think it is a good place to stop and take some questions. That is certainly true. That is certainly true. Um, but yeah, I mean. Uh, yeah, so the, so the operator algebra, so the acting on, an, on a subregion is not quite the way to think about it. It is the, the operators are associated to that region. So because operators are labeled by X, right? But if you want to act on something, you have to act on a state. And that state is roughly speaking associated to the entire Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. Okay? Operators local, exactly. So, and the point is that the entanglement entropy between subregions is not associated to the state localized in that subregion because there is no such notion in quantum field theory, but it is associated to the algebra. The algebra is that is the localized thing that you have is the algebra and not the, um, you know, and not, the, not a state that is localized there. So, for instance, the vacuum state of a quantum field theory is basically, uh, is, it's a global object. So, for instance, you might say, oh, why did I then work with, uh, you know, uh, the Hilbert space or Fock space of Rindler? That's a kind of a nonsense thing to do. I sh I, for the claims that I made, the claims turn out to be correct. And I was kind of treating it as a sort of, a, you know, half a spin system here, half a spin system here, that you can kind of keep that in mind. Uh, but it is not completely true, you know, it's not really like, uh, I should not really be writing these, uh, um, you know, this Rindler modes, I should not really think of them in terms of, uh, as you know, like, th there is no such state which is not entangled. So if, if, if that tensor factorization that I wrote was completely true, right? So I wrote this omega as a thermophile double which involves some I, L and I, R. Right? If it was, if this was to be taken literally, if this was to be taken literally, some coefficient here, okay, so then I could imagine the possibility that I had a state that lived only on the left factor. And then it would not be entangled at all with the rest of the stuff. But in quantum field theory, that's not possible. Okay? Anytime there is a, there is a set of operators that act on some subregion, 
then the entanglement entropy associated with that in the other subregion is always divergent because of the short distance divergence. Yeah, so this state is way better defined than the individual things on the right hand side. That's what I'm saying. But the calculations that we did are there are various reasons why they are quite reasonable. So they are not, uh, you know, so um, yeah, so and in fact, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, so I mean, there is, in fact, I mean, there are very recent papers from the, maybe a couple of months ago which say that uh, even though the standard, so one thing I did not say here is that, so there is a, there is a class of this, those, this, the, 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 the this branch of, let's say, quantum field theory or physics or whatever that studies this kind of thing is basically the study of von Neumann algebras. Okay, so these von Neumann algebras. So one fact, I mean, you don't have to know, I mean, uh, what they are, but the, the, the subregions in quantum field theory are associated to what are called type 3 von Neumann algebras, okay? And type 3 von Neumann algebras do not have this, uh, you cannot, they don't have localized states, for example, okay? So, and, uh, but yeah, so the, the one observation that has very recently been made is that by only using the ingredients that are there, in quantum field theory, you can actually elevate this to a, from type 3 to what is called a type 2 algebra where things are better defined. So for, for instance, yeah, I mean anyway, so I'm kind of going, uh, you know, if you want to take a look, there is a paper by Jefferson and uh, somebody else, can't remember. Just one more person. Sorry? Berlin Day? I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. But uh, the papers that I have thought, I've seen are, uh, you know, the main ones are by, there is a bunch of papers by Witten in the last, uh, I think and they are extremely transparent papers. So it's like you can, if you want to listen to them, by all means do because it's, uh, you know, four diameter algebras are like complicated objects. When physics, physicists work with complicated mathematical objects, you know, it generally means that we are using them as black boxes. You know, we are not really, so if you want to really prove, uh, for, you know, various things in von Neumann algebras, you will really have to work with, you know, like uh, setting bounds and proving inequalities and, you know, really actually do hard work, which we do not like to do. So what we do is instead, you know, we treat them as black boxes and the story is nonetheless quite coherent and interesting. So uh, there are, like I think Witten's lectures on these things, or there are many of them on YouTube. I encourage you to go and listen to them. Okay, so, uh, but this particular thing that I mentioned is, uh, I don't think he mentions that, but it is just the fact that there is a sense in which quantum field theory, local, op local algebras in quantum field theory can actually be elevated, local algebras in subregions, you can, uh, you know, elevate them from type 3 to type 2, uh, you know, and type 2 is better because some, you know, at least density matrices are well defined and so on. So that kind of uh, construction is basically a paper by Jefferson and I think his student. Okay, so uh, I think I'll stop here. Any other questions? Yeah, let's, yeah. Huh? Does it mean that, like if I took any state, on the species of size, and this statement is true for any state, that's all the statement that it's a... So if, if you got, yeah, so if you, if you want to split my, the first thing to notice is that the splitting a subregion is a statement about how you are splitting operators. It's not a statement about states. That's the first observation. Because what it is really saying is that operators living in the subregion are basically what are called, what is basically forming the operator algebra of that subregion. Okay, so those are essentially because, as I said, local operators are always labeled by some parameter that we call space time location. So, which means that if you have a subset in space time, which is basically what a subregion is, there is associated to it, there is a set of operators that you can define. And that set of operators is, uh, is what captures the entanglement information and not the states that you can potentially localize here as opposed to here, because all states in quantum field theory live in the entire Hilbert space. There is, I mean, entire thing, there is no such thing as really a factorization, okay? So, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Anyway, we are kind of ahead of time, so I was kind of thinking that because last couple of days I've been torturing you, I'll go a little slow. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So there is a, specifically about conformal field theories. There is actually a discussion in um, Witten's uh, review. So, since I think I will let the master speak. 
So uh, there is a discussion. I think it's a short discussion about you, how you know uh, you can how radial quantization these kinds of things fit together. So there is in this one of his reviews from I think that very late last year. I think what, what why does quantum field theory make sense and uh, what does it uh, tell something 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 like that. So that's the title. So you can go take a look. It's uh, you know it's, it's you know I haven't read it carefully enough, but I'm trying to. So any other questions? So. <coughs> this correlation between the space like yeah. things, does it interfere somehow with the causality like the No, because they are space like separators, right? So the, the thing that really affects causality is commutators. Mm -hmm. So roughly speaking, you are doing an, a measurement and then doing a measurement after that. And if you reverse its order, what happens? That's what really is like if this op this measurement that you do at a later time can only be affected if that measurement is in the past light cone of a previous measurement. So an operator acting at some particular location can only affect this measurement if this is your future light cone and you're sitting here. So if you're here, it doesn't affect anything. So you can have any kind of correlation that you want and uh, it doesn't, uh, you cannot translate it into propagating signals for instance. I mean, this is kind of one reason why we don't think of Bell in Bell's inequalities as like a real communication channel right so there are correlations between here and far away but they are not there is no way that you can actually send use that as a method of communication because these are essentially those are spatially you know space like separated correlations so those correlations exist and they exist essentially because you know so in in bell's example he constructs specific states which are entangled but quantum field theory is telling you that vacuum of quantum field theory itself is like that Okay, and it's much more crazy than this actually because of this, you know, like you have they have a statement called Riesz-Leder theorem, which means that uh, in quantum field theory, without gravity, uh, if you act with a sufficiently complicated operator, because the states are so entangled. So let me, I think that's a since I have some time, maybe this is a good <coughs> side remark to make. So, so I'll show you a toy example of Riesz-Leder theorem. Okay, so, so Riesz later theorem is that's a kind of a, like you know in Witten's uh, review on entanglement he basically talks about it so you can find the proof and the proof is you know it uses analysis and some edge of the wedge theorem type of ideas it's not completely you know it's not super complicated but the basic idea is very simple so if you have an entangled state like this. Okay, I left an R, some, some entangled state, doesn't have to be Rindler or Minkowski or anything. So the point is that you can, so let's say you acted with, so the way you distinguish, let's say a state which has some excited particles or some, you know, stars or galaxies or whatever in, you know, in, in, in your vacuum somewhere far away. So the way in which you would understand that state is by acting on, so let's call this, you know, this is somewhere in Andromeda, this qubit, and this is here on Earth, okay? So Earth and Andromeda. So and let's say you o operate with some operator that acts only on Earth. As long as it is a sufficient, you know, and the point is that because the state is entangled, any um, excited state or any um, action on any, any operator acting on this state can be realized by acting with some complicated operator on only one of the states. Is that clear? Because if I act with some operator here, it will do one thing, some complicated thing. It may not be a very natural thing even. But I can always get some O acting on Psi by acting on some O tilde acting on E in this way. Okay? So this is, so this means that in principle you can, you know, if quantum field theory was the only thing in effect and there was no gravity and so on, you could just basically act with a sufficiently complex operator right here on Earth and make things change in Andromeda. Okay, or change it, or another thing is you can create something in Andromeda, let's say. Okay, so this is something in principle you could do. But this is of course physically not possible because the, these operators that will do something far away, oftentimes in quantum field theory or something, these are horrendously fine-tuned complicated operators. Okay, and usually the energetic cost of operators like this is so high that if you try to do it, you'll form a black hole. So in, so in gravity, when gravity is there, these things are not really allowed. But at a very basic level, it's very intuitive that if you have an entangled state, you can make things happen, at least in the, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the if you work within, in a language where you're thinking of uh, things happening on the other state, but you can always arrange it to happen by doing something for the other state, which is under your control. 
So that's a property of the fact that the vacuum of quantum field theory is highly entangled. Okay, so this is uh, so this phenomenon, this feature, is you know the, this uh, formalization in quantum field theory is called Riesz Lieder theorem. Okay, so uh, yeah. I'll take, I think one more question and then we can, if there is one. Ah, yes, go ahead. Is correlation implies entanglement So there is, you know, there are these uh, uh, measures of entanglement which subtract out classical correlations. You can design such things. Okay? So I'm not an expert on them, but I do know that they exist. So you can construct, like for instance, entanglement entropy is uh, not entirely you know, there is, some, there is a notion of distillable entanglement. So I think you should talk to somebody who is uh, more of an expert on quantum information than me. So, but it's roughly, yeah, that's the idea. So there is, you know, all, not all correlations, you know. So Bell's inequalities, any violation of Bell's inequality is basically a quantum correlation, if you like, right? So there is, but correlations are, Bell's inequality basically tells you that the, you know, any time Bell's inequality is satisfied, that could in principle be arranged by classical correlations. Right? So in that sense, clearly not all correlation is quantum. But whatever, you know, at least at the bare minimum level, we know that quantum mechanics can be made to violate these correlations, these inequalities. So which means that there exists pieces of these correlations which are not entirely classical. So that's the idea. Any other questions? Okay, I think I'll stop here actually. Because uh, let me quit when I'm ahead. You know what I'm saying? <laughs>